Good day, Grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson in Stats and Probability. In this lesson, we're going to carry on with doing statistical questions, and um, we had done quite a few yesterday already, and we're going to carry on with that. And I know that it's tedious to work out the line of least regression, but we're going to have to do that. Um, because what I said to you that, so we're going to be using that as a calculator in this um, stat mode. And I know it's tedious and it takes a long time, but we have to make sure that we can do it. Okay. So in this last question, yeah, this but yeah, we actually worked out the mean percentage, we worked out the standard deviation, we worked out the number of candidates, and now we have to do this but yeah. Okay, we have to do this bit here. And I said that I was going to leave it till today because we've done so many yesterday. So what I would like to suggest you do is you guys get out your calculators and see if you can beat me to it. If you can actually get, remember that we what we're doing is we're getting y is equal to a plus bx. Okay, and we're going to use our least squares regression line, our line of best fit to get that. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to use our calculator. And I, like I said yesterday, it doesn't matter whether you're using an HP or a Sharp or a Casio. They all have kind of the same functions. But guys, please feel free. Please go and find that method in your manuals. Um, as I've said before, it's that big watch of paper that you probably threw away when you bought the, the calculator. Hope you didn't. I hope it's in the box. If not, just Google. Google the um, make of your calculator and it will tell you how to do this. Um, otherwise, you yeah, go ask a teacher. Okay, so now remember that the mathematics is on the x axis and the counting is on the y axis. And the first thing you have to do is make sure you're in the stat mode. So make sure you're in the stat mode. You want to choose the a plus bx. Okay, and you'll end up with something that looks like this, where there'll be x values and y values. Right. So I'm going to put the numbers in. So I've got 52, enter, um, 82, enter, it's a little bit faster today, 93, enter, 95, not that much faster, enter, uh, 71, my hips up, enter, 65, enter, 77, enter, uh, 42, Sorry, I just realized that this here is an outlier and that is sitting at 82 and 62. So in fact, I need to clear this because I need to exclude my outlier. So you have to be very careful about this and I made the same mistake yesterday. You have to make sure you don't include your outlier in the data, okay? So that means this here is our outlier. Obviously, that is that number there. So you've got to realize two things. One, is that um, you need to make sure that you do not include your outlier. And secondly, your data doesn't have to be in the order in which it is plotted. So you have to go look for that data. This is at point X is 82 and Y is 62. So I had to go look and find out where X is 82 and Y is 62. And you can see that that is your outlier there that we're going to exclude. Now we need to put the data in again. So let's start again. We're going to go mode two, two, and now we need to start again, so it's going to be 52 equals 93 equals 95 equals 71 equals 65 equals 77 equals 42, 89. By now, you guys should be way ahead of me. So by the time I have finished putting in my data, I'm hoping that you'll have got the equation of y is equal to a plus bx. Um, 
and that you will be able to see if you get the same values as me. Um, this is actually quite an important skill to have for the simple reason that if you get this wrong, um, well, if you don't know how to do this and you have to do it manually and the manual calculation is incredibly long and tedious, way more long and tedious than actually putting these values into the calculator. OK, so now we've got 60. Equals 88. Equals 90. Equals 72 equals 67 no 67 equals 75 equals 48 equals 83, 3, 3 equals uh, 57 equals 52 equals, and the last number 62. Yay, 62 equals, and then we say AC. Then remember, we're going to go find the number one, the stat. We go shift and we go stat, and then we need reg, okay, because it's a linear regression. So that reg stands for regression actually. So we choose five, and then we want the a value. So a value is one, and you say equals, and it's 20.18. So a is going to be 20,18 plus and now we need to find b so again we go back to our calculator and again we go shift stat stat and we choose rage for regression and we go work out what b is which is two and we say equals and we get 0 0.72 so it's going to be plus 0,72x. And you might wonder why I'm bothering to do this if we did two examples yesterday. And the reason is actually for this example, this part of the question, because we actually haven't done a question like this before. So it says if a candidate from this group scored 60%, okay, if they caught six in the maths exam but was absent for the counting exam, predict, predict the percentage that this candidate would have scored in the counting exam using your equation. Okay, so do you agree that before we would have probably tried to draw a base fit line, so we would have probably tried to draw something like that, and then we would have gone up, and we would have crossed there, and then gone along, and gone, well, that looks like about plus minus 64% plus minus okay but the problem is that this base fit line is not very accurate now we have a very accurate base fit line we have the x value here is 60 so now all we have to do is put this equation into the calculator and we're sorted so let's do that so first thing we need to do is get out of stat so we go mode and one okay so now we're normal so it's gonna be 0 0.72 multiplied by 60 because it's 60%, it's x60, then add 20.18 equals, press the SD button, and it's 63.38. Jeez, our equation was not, our line was not too bad. So it's 63.38. So the prediction would be 63,38%, but then we're not finished because it says round off your answer to the nearest integer. And what is the integer? An integer is a whole number so therefore this is going to round off to 
63%. So I wasn't too bad. I wasn't too far off with my 64%. But you can see that that's a problem with drawing, just drawing basic lines, is you really don't know exactly where you're going to be drawing it. Whereas this gives you the exact value. Okay, so that was the line of least squares, um, regression line. Now we're going to do a little bit more practice on looking at mean heights and standard deviation and um, interval of one standard deviation and percentage of players within the standard deviation mean because you do a lot of um, the box and whisker in grade 10 and grade 11 but then you don't do much of the standard deviation in grade 12. And again this is calculator work that you need to know how to do so we're going to go back okay and we're going to go back to clearing it and we're going to go to mode but this time do you notice that there is only one variable, the height in centimeters. So though we're choosing stat again, we're now choosing the one variable. So we're choosing one, okay? And now we just input the numbers. So it's 178 equals 184 equals 186. 86 equals 180. 6 equals 192 equals 194 equals 195 <gasps> equals 197 oh dear equals 190 7 equals 198 8 equals and then 201 nope. equals and then what you do is you see that we've got 10 numbers and we count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 hmm so we've left out one so let's go up and we check which ones we've left out okay because that's what you always have to do you always have to check okay so we've got 178 tick 184 tick 186 okay so that's three four is going to be 186 good five should be 192 6, 194, 7, 195. Aha, we've left out one of the 195s. And it doesn't matter what order you do them in, so we can just put it in here. 195, nope, 95, and then you can go equals. Okay, so now we've got all our data and we've got our 11 numbers. Now I said determine the mean height of the players. Now I know some of you would have gone, well, it's really easy You just add all the heights and divide by the number of players. Yes, you could have done that. But since we have the data, we now have can work out the mean height, we can work out the standard deviation, etc, etc. So let's have a look at this, okay? So let's go to, we first we press AC, and then we go shift, and then stat, and then we look for four, because it's one variable. So we're going to go four, and we want the mean, and this is X, the X with the line of plus means, we want the mean, so that's two, and equals, and it's 191.45, 191.45, um, it doesn't say anything here about decimal places, so I'm going to round everything off to the whole number, so I'm going to make it at 191, so I'm going to say this mean height is 191. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to look for the standard deviation, so we go shift, one again, hmm. oh dear, we go, yes, and then we go four again for variable, this, this year, this delta, sigma x, this year is the standard deviation, so we're going to press three, and we're going to press equals, and we said 6.69, which rounds off to seven, so that's seven. So now it says determine the interval of heights within one standard deviation of the mean. So do you understand that what we're saying is that the average of this is 191, give or take seven, okay? So therefore we could say that this range is from 198 to 191 minus 7, which is 184, 
Okay, that's what this range is, right. Now it says, so we've done that. Now it says determine the percentage of players whose heights are within one standard deviation of the mean. Okay, so we want numbers of the students' heights that are within, so it has to, can include the 184 and include the 198. So do you agree it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine out of the 11 players are within one standard deviation of the mean. So what can we do? We need to times that by 100 over one to get the percentage. So we go nine divided by 11, 11 equals, and then we multiply it by 100 equals and that becomes 81.8 and since all the other numbers we've rounded off to the whole number we're going to round this off so it becomes 82 percent so 82 percent of the players fall within one standard deviation of the mean it means what that means is that the average height of the players is very 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 close to um the number the okay let's put it this way it isn't a very big spread in their heights. Okay, that's what this is saying. Okay, now let's look at another example. And this time it's the cumulative frequency in the OGIVE. And again, I'm doing this question because I feel that a lot of students struggle with OGIVES and OGIVES or whatever you want to call them. And we need to show how to do it. Okay. And also sometimes you get a little bit bogged down on the new stuff you learn in grade 12 and then forget about the stuff that you've learned before in previous years which is the problem. Okay, so let's go through it. It says the following frequency table shows the distribution of the marks of 200 students in a mathematics test out of 60. Okay, so it says complete the cumulative frequency table in the space provided. So do you agree that 20 kids got 10 and less? Okay, 60 kids got 20 and the 40 that got between 10 and 20, but now there are 60 kids who got 20 and less. 60 plus 6 is 120, so 120 kids got 30 and less, okay, plus 50 is 170, so 170 got 40 and less, another 20, so that's going to be 190, got 50 and less, and finally 200 of them got 60 and less. So there is your cumulative frequency. Okay, now we want to plot this, okay? So remember you plot your marks on your mathematics marked on the horizontal and your cumulative frequency is always on the vertical, okay? And I see we're going 20, 40, 60, okay. So I'm thinking we're gonna go zero, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, 160, 180, 200. And from here, we're going to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Okay. So do you agree that 20 people got, 20 people got a frequency of cumulative frequency and this is okay this is marks sorry so 20 people got 10 okay 60 people got 20 then we've got 120 people got 30 and less we have got 170 people got 40 and less okay 50 marks were allocated to 190 people. And then finally, 200 people got that. Okay, so therefore the graph goes like, and I apologize for that, I shouldn't have missed it. Guys, please don't do what I just did because obviously, um, if what should happen, if I try and erase this, it erases the whole line, like your almost whole line. So you've got to be careful about how you do this and then make sure that you use a pencil 
and an eraser to draw your graph. Okay. Right, so there you go. This is the chemical frequency. So now we've drawn the chemical frequency. Okay. Now it says use your graph to estimate the interquartile range. So the interquartile range, IQR, is Q3 minus Q2. Okay, do you agree? So do you agree that we need to find, we have got 200 students. Okay. So we need to find out what is a quarter of 200 students is about 50. So do you agree we're going to go up here? Okay, because half our students is 100, so half of that is a quarter, which is 50. So we're going to go up here and we're going to go 50. And we're going to go read it across. And we see that that is about, about 18. Okay, so that's 18. Then we go up to 150, because that would be the Q, sorry, this is Q1, Q3. And if we go across over there, and we go down, do you see that's about 35? So therefore the IQR is going to be, okay, and let me just talk about what I just did, okay? What I said was that, um, we need to get the interquartile range, but the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. So you've got 200 students, okay? So if I had to break that into four categories, do you agree I would divide that by 50 to get my four categories or divide by four to get 50? So therefore Q1 is going to be at the 50th student, more or less. Q2 is going to be more or less 100 students and Q3 is going to be approximately 150 students. Okay, so that's what I've done. And this is the only time in the graphs that I've ever come across where you read the y-axis first, find that value, go across, and then read the x-axis. So you can see that at the moment we've got that Q3 is one is going to be 35, minus Q1, which is about 18. So you've got 15 minus, or yeah, 35. So 15 minus 8 is 7, and... 2 minus 1 is 1. So the interquartile range here is 17. 17. Then it says the top 40% of the students would need, would, won't need to rewrite the test. Use the graph to determine the cutoff mark. The top 40% of the students determine the cutoff mark. Use the graph to determine the cutoff mark. Okay, so if we think about that, okay, we need the top 40%. So what is 40% or better still, what is 60% of 200? Because the bottom 60% have to work, use, I'm going to have to rewrite the test. So we're going to go 60, let's write it over here. We're going to go 60 over 100 times by 200. These cancel and six times two is 120. So the bottom 120 students, from 120 students down, they have to rewrite the test. So therefore, I can go back up along my y-axis and find the frequency of 120, and I go along there, and then I go back down, and I see the cutoff mark is 30. So the cutoff mark is 30 out of, out of 60 which is 50%. Okay, right, so there you can see that that is how you would work out the top 40% of the students not being able to, have to read, rewrite the test. Okay, now let's look at the two box and whisker diagrams represented with marks of 200 learners, each from different schools, okay? So you get two box and whisker diagrams representing the marks of 200 learners each from two different schools for the same test out of 60. Answer the following question. So we've got school A, that there has got a median at 28, and it's got, this is Q1, okay, this is Q3, this is, and then, oh dear, just a second. Um, okay, don't worry, I'll get it back.
Um, where were we? There we go. So this is Q, uh, this is Q1. This is the median, which is Q2. This is Q3. The test is out of 60. So we said that somebody got 60 marks and somebody got the lowest mark here was zero, okay? Yeah, the lowest mark was 15. Yeah, it's Q1 is at 25, which is much higher. Then you've got Q2. What the hell is going on? I apologize for that. I don't quite know why it disappeared. Um, I'm just busy giving you um, the video now, getting it back up. There we go. So now you should be able to hear me and see me. Okay, right. So where was I? I was telling you that this spot here was school B, was this was Q1, there's Q2, Q3, and there was 60. So you can see that school B seems to have done better overall in the test than school A. It says what percentage of school B's results were above 55 out of 60? So what percentage of Q school B's results um, were above 55 out of 60. So let's have a look at this. It says that there were 200 learners, each from different schools, the same test out of 60. Okay, so do you agree this this would be um, Q1 is a quarter, okay? This is a half, this is three quarters. So it says what percentage of the school's results would be above 55 out of 60 would be more than three quarters. So it would be more than 75%. Okay, no, sorry, wrong way, it would be 25%. So since 75% would be three quarters and would be 55 and below, what's left is a quarter and that is 25%. So 25% of the school B's results, okay, were 55, were above 55 out of 60. Okay, now it says school A claims that the overall results are better than school B's. Is this true? Explain your answer referring to the summary statistics. And I would say no, that is not true. It is not true. Um, I admit that their spread is smaller. Okay, there was A has got a smaller spread. Okay, but on the whole, B. First of all, the lower quartile, the lower quartile is greater than, um, no, it's not. The lower quartile is, yeah, it is great. The lower quartile for B is greater than the lower quartile for A, okay? B's, in fact, everything. B's Q2 and the median, B's median, is bigger than that for A, okay? B's upper quartile is bigger than that for uh, Q3. Um, but that, for, that is bigger than for maths, I mean for A. So overall, even though this is skewed to the left, and we've got more students that have got between 50 and 25, Overall, we still have more students doing greater, I mean, better marks than 25 out of 60 than you have for Q1, I mean, for school A. So that way, I would say that no, they're wrong. School B definitely did a better job. Okay, 
Now let's talk about probability. So what I've done is I've decided that the problem with probability is that it's kind of a new section. Um, and for that reason, um, and I must be honest about this, for that reason, a lot of teachers don't know the subject very well, don't know that part very well. Um, they've kind of maybe skim read it, skim read it. And what happens is they tend to rush through it, okay? It does, it's not a huge part of the curriculum, so it's not a big deal. Um, but since it is part of the curriculum, and it is a possibility for you to earn quite good marks in that section. I think we should go through it. So I've started off with the basic definitions, okay? So an experiment, and you need to know these definitions to be able to use the words properly. And if you can use the words properly, then you'll be able to um, apply your knowledge accurately, okay? So first of all, experiment refers to an uncertain process. So for example, if I toss a coin or throw a die. Now, die is singular for dice, by the way. So if I'm throwing dice, I've got two of them. So if I flip a coin or throw a die or um, any type of experiment that refers to an uncertain process, you don't know what the result is going to be. That is an experiment. The outcomes are what actually happens from a single experiment. So if I flip a coin and it gives me heads, then that's an outcome. If I flip it and it gives me tails, that's another outcome. If I pick a card out of 52 and I get um, a two of spades, that's an outcome. Okay, so an outcome is what we get out from that experiment, but it's a single result from an experiment. Okay. Um, a sample space, that is a set of all the possible outcomes for an experiment. So if, for example, I say to you, we're going to flip the coin, you've got two options. And don't tell me about this landing on the edge thing, okay? It can either land on its head or it can land on its tail, okay? So those are your options. If I ask you to throw a die, your options are, and again, don't tell me about the fact that you can possibly land um, on the corner or the edge and everything else. Your options are one, two, three, four, five, six. End of story. If I ask you to pull a card of a pack of 52, you've got 52 possible outcomes, okay, if we ignore the jokers. So you've got 52 possible outcomes of pulling out a specific card. So that is the sample space. The sample space is what is the set of all the possible outcomes. The number of the sample is the number of outcomes in the sample space. So for a coin, it's only got heads and tails. So therefore, the number of the sample space is going to be two. Whereas if you've got to throw in a die, you have the option of throwing one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? Which means you've got six options. So to the number of possible outcomes in the sample space is going to be six in this case. Now let's talk about an event. Event is a specific outcome. So if I toss my coin and I get a tail, okay, then that is a specific event. So if I, if I get tails if I flip a coin, then we say that that event resulted in tails, okay? Or if I roll a die and I end up with a six, that means that that specific event entailed a six, okay? So the number of events is the number of elements in the subset. So for both of the above, the number of the elements in the subset is going to be one, okay? So now let's talk about theoretical probability versus relative frequency. I know I'm going through this quite quickly, but guys, this is actually old work that you guys should know from grade 10 and grade 11. So you should actually know this stuff. And if you don't, please go, up and go back and read up on it, okay? So let me tell you about the difference between theoretical probability and relative frequency. The theoretical probability is this, okay? If I say to you that you, have got a coin. And I said, what are the chances of you throwing a, a tail or a head? Okay. Then do you agree that if this coin is equally weighted, you've got a 50-50 chance of it either landing on its head or landing on tails, right? So therefore, we can say that the probability is a half or 50%, okay? Similarly for a die, if the die is not loaded, if they haven't changed it in some way to make it land one specific way, then you've got a one in six chance of it landing on any of the sides. So the equation for this is 
the number of elements in the event divided by the number of elements in the sample space. So the number of elements in the event E, which would be the number of E that the hair lands on its head or its tail is one, and the number of elements in the sample space is that its heads or tails is two. And similarly for a dive. Now that's theoretical probability. So if I say to you, um, yeah, I'm gonna toss a coin, Heads, we stay at home. Um, tails, we go out to watch a movie. You think, okay, I've got a 50-50% chance, 50% chance of getting this right, okay, of going out to a movie, whatever. Okay, however, relative frequency is what actually happens. It's the actual happening. So that's the total number of favorable outcomes out of the total number of trials, okay? So, for example, if I say to you, okay, let's throw, um, let's throw with a, a coin, okay? The coin has the option of either falling on this with the cross or it falls in the circle. Those are the options, okay? So we throw it once and it falls on the cross, okay? Now, the second time we throw it, and this is what a lot of gamblers mess up on, the second time we throw it, the coin does have, doesn't have any memory of what it fell on last time. It doesn't think, oh, well, last time I fell on the cross, so this time I'm going to fall on a circle. Okay, it doesn't have that memory. So this time it might fall on a cross again. And then the third time we throw it, again, the coin has no memory. It has no idea of what it did the last time you threw it. So this time it might fall on the head, okay? So you have a two-third, two out of three, probability, okay, of, okay, so it's, yeah, two out of three, total number of favorable outcomes, if that's what our favorable was, versus three, okay, so it's two-thirds of a probability or one-third of a probability, and that's the real the probability, that's the relative frequency, so the relative frequency is what actually happens versus the theoretical probability, which is what is quoted, okay, so when I say to you that's what the gamblers are saying, they'll say, oh, we're on a roll. You know, I'm always throwing sixes. You need to understand this. The dice that you're playing with have no idea that you've been throwing sixes. So they're not going to go, oh, well, let's go six, six, six. Okay, well, the probability is that there might be another six now, or there might be a four or whatever. The dice has no idea. The cards don't have any idea of what's been pulled beforehand. Okay, so therefore, you cannot count on relative frequency with gambling. Okay, so now let's talk about unions and intersections and um, dependent and independent results because we need to know that. Okay, so a union of events is a set of all outcomes that occur in at least one of the events. Okay, so the notation is AUB, U standing for union. So let's, for, ex for example, we've got A, which is all the numbers from 1, 2, 3, and 4. B are the number, the factors of nine. Actually, no, it's not. It's just multiples of three to nine. So it's three, six, nine. So do you agree the union of this is going to be one, two, three, four, six, and nine? One, two, three, four, and six, and nine. Because it is what everything that's made up of this one plus or everything that's in that one. And you don't have to write the threes a second time. Okay, so that's what union means, okay? Versus intersection is a set of all outcomes that occur in all the events, okay? So in other words, the notation is A intersection B. So again, if we look at these two numbers, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, and 3, 6, 9. So what number occurs in both of them? The only number that occurs in both of them is 3. Therefore, we can say that A intersection B is 3. Okay, get it. Right, and I am going to stop there. We'll start on mutually exclusive events um, tomorrow, and then we'll move on, I mean, on Monday. <laughs> Sorry, tomorrow. Um, t on Monday, and we will go through a whole bunch of different examples on probability. Right, grade 12, I hope you have an awesome weekend. I hope that you're spending at least some of it studying for the finals, since all oh, the prelims and the finals, since, you know, it's coming up soon. Have a great day.